The, the word that I felt for paradise was twofold. Uh, one, I'm going to preach it out, as it were. But the, before I get to that, I want to share with you this one phrase. Well, several phrases, but coming out of one. Let go in order to embrace. And I felt the Lord just say to me when I was in prayer for you a couple of days ago, uh, and I can't remember me ever, I'm kind of getting this phrase for a church, and I've been at it for 50 years. Last year was my 50th year in ministry, and I, I never can remember this phrase before. But he just said to me when I was interceding for the church, he said, nothing is sacred but God and his word. And so do not seek to hold on to a glorious past when there is an incredible future to be embraced. And Isaiah 43, 18 and 19 says, don't even consider. Don't even stop to consider the things of old. For behold, now I do a new thing. And now it's going to spring forth. And, and I, I felt that there was a major initiative lying ahead that would directly challenge the, the nostalgia of yesterday and yet would open the door to extraordinary multiplication in the future. Now, friends, I, I want you to hear my, the terms I'm using. I didn't say incredible addition. I didn't say incredible growth. I said incredible multiplication. And when I said, Father, why are you making such a bone about this word? And he said, because if I was talking about numerical growth, if I was talking about this campus growing more, I'd have used different terms. But I'm talking about multiplication. And when I, I suddenly realized he was talking about campuses and the number of campuses. And so what I want to say to you is this. There is a major initiative lying ahead that will challenge the nostalgia of yesterday but will open the door for extraordinary multiplication in the future. Okay, but you've got to let go in order to embrace. Now, when I was in Atlanta, and if you're watching, hello again. What, what, what they're doing in Atlanta is absolutely extraordinary. It's, it's, it's fantastic. And Margaret and I just loved the time there with Pastor Ashley and Jane. I'm not saying that because they could end up listening to it. It's because we buzzed about it the whole way home in the plane. And it was the most wonderful time. And I'm excited about what's happening there. But I'm extremely excited about what's happening here. And friends, I want to talk to you this morning about a scripture that I really believe God wants to put in your heart. It's, in, it's going to be in Joshua, and we're going to get there in just a moment. But this young man down here, you're looking to your left, but you don't have to. Now you're saying, me? Yeah, you. Okay. Uh, you were standing over here, right? Aha. Uh -huh. you, you, you've got to get the next few months get right into preparation, like serious preparation, because the Lord's going to open the door for you to reconnect to your roots. And, you know, let me put it this way. We, in the house, we can have a resident grace, a resident responsibility. That's the, car that's the responsibility we carry. But God can at times actually insert, he doesn't replace all of that, but he inserts a moment of time where he takes that person for deliberate intent and puts them somewhere else just for a few days or a week or something and then brings them right back in. You understand what I'm saying? And the Lord's going to do that for you and it's got something to do with your heritage and your roots. But you've got to make yourself ready for that going to carry the grace of God into desperately hungry situation. Okay, God bless you. Um, now, where was I? Yeah, I want you to understand that anything born of God will be tested. And that's as sure as the coming up of the sun. 
But what I also want to tell you is this, that, af- that opposition is not a denial of your commission. Opposition is actually, actually a, an affirmation of your commission. Why? Because, because Satan only opposes what he fears. But we have to realize that our God is far greater than that opposition. And I think the words that burned in my heart when I was praying for you were words like persevere, prevail, push through. It's an attitude that, that gets resolved and says, I don't care what happens. What God has spoken, we're going to end up doing it. If God has given a word to our leadership and declared it over us, then it doesn't matter what the enemy says or does, we have crossed the line. We are resolved. We will carry through. You know, in Hebrews chapter 10, 35 and 36, uh, um, the writer says, don't cast away your confidence because it's got incredible reward. And then it says, for you have need of endurance that after you've done the will of God, you may still receive the promise. In other words, it's possible that you can initially obey the word of commission, the word of God that God's given you, and still miss out on the promise. Why? Because there is always an insertion of time between our initial response and the reward, the promise being fulfilled, where that is tested. And it's what we do in the moment of our testing that determines whether we receive that promise or not. And so, friends, he says you have got need of endurance so that after you've done the will of God, you may receive the promise, the intention of the whole thing. The word endurance is incredibly interesting because it says, and let me quote to you literally, the literal translation now, the word endurance, the characteristic of a person, listen to this, the characteristic of a person who is not swerved by any degree of opposition or contradiction from his or her deliberate an intended purpose. Man, I like that. In other words, it's that steel-like resolve that says we will carry through. We will do what God Almighty gave us to do. Can you say amen to that? Friends, the difference between people with a persuasion and people with a conviction from God is what you do in that in-between insertion of time. And friends, I I believe God wants to put a deep, deep resolve within us. But I need you to know that he, He has gone before you and He's planned for every contingency. Do you know that nothing ever takes Him by surprise? He lives in eternity. He's here this morning, but He's also lives in five years from now and three years from now. Nothing takes Him by surprise. In his full full knowledge, knowledge, he has provided provided everything everything necessary. necessary. The The South South Campus Campus is looking for a building. building. But my father father knew all about that before he ever told you to plant the South Campus. campus. Well, why haven't they got a building now then? Well, that's perfectly clear. Because he wants the miracle to be all the greater. You see, uh, there's plenty of human solutions to that problem, but there's a supernatural one. Okay, I want us to go to Joshua chapter 6, if you would. You alive and well out there? I love this house. I want to talk about the walls of Jericho. You say, oh, we flogged that thing to death. Well, okay, well, let's flog it again. Okay. Joshua chapter 6, verse 16 says this, Shout. Shout for the Lord has giving you the city. So I want you to first of all notice that the terminology says he has given you the city. So he's not confused about it. All the heaven's not confused about it. It's been declared from the throne of glory. Our God has given us a city. You, city has been given to you. So that's already established in the realm of the spirit. Every angel knows it. Every demon knows it. In the realm of the spirit, it has been established. But then go to verse 20. So the people shouted when the priests blew the trumpets, and it happened when. Everybody say the word when. When. 
Say it real loud. When? 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 And it happened when the people heard the sound of the trumpet, the declaration of leadership and intention, that trumpet, when they heard the sound of the trumpet, that the people shouted with a great crescendo of shout, and the wall fell down flat. Now, friends, what I want to say to you is this. Because it says that later then it says the people went up and into the city and they took the city. Amazing. Now, if God had established it in the spirit, if God had already said, I've given you the city, why did they need to shout? And what is so significant about a shout anyhow? Well, friends, you've got to take a look at the people involved. There were thousands of them. There were tens of thousands of them. Hundreds of thousands of them. And there were every kind of disposition, every kind of background, every kind of vocation, every kind of responsibility. They were different in every conceivable way. And yet... And yet the Bible records, and it doesn't come out so clear in the King James, but, but when they shouted, it was with a singular note of incredible intensity. So, so what was the what was significance of that shout? Oh, friends, the significance was that it was one shout. Tens of thousands of people, diverse people, yet one sound. And friends, it was the unity of the shout that brought the miraculous intervention of God. God has never done anything of significance on the globe without finding a people that will come into a unity together. And the very birth of the church in the book of Acts was, and the miraculous, and 3,000 souls saved in a day. And people put it down. What, what, what caused that? What, what allowed that to take place? Was it because they were waiting and fasting and praying? What was the story? No, 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 no. You've got to listen. The Bible says there were one mind in one accord in one place. The reason why the Holy Spirit could sweep in with such power was because they were in unity in the upper room. They had one sound together. Friends, your spiritual authority will never be greater than your unity. Will be that in your marriage, be that in your family, be it in your business, be it in your church. Your spiritual authority will never be greater than the level of your unity. Why? Because every demon in hell and every angel in glory knows that God has commanded the blessing only in one place, and that's where brethren dwell together in unity. There has to be one mind, one accord in one place and that will release the miraculous and the supernatural. Whether you're talking about a family, a business or a church. Now I want to go to verse 1 because although this we've just read about a miraculous wonderful story, it doesn't actually start there at all. Joshua chapter 6 and verse 1, this is where the story really starts. Now the gates of Jericho were securely barred because of the Israelites and no one went out and no one came in. Friends, uh, you've got to get a hold of this picture now. The, the, the archaeologists and historians tell us that Jericho was one of the oldest cities known in the world at that time. It had been there for a very, very, very long time. But it also tells us that it had been impregnable, that it had never been taken by an army. Not once in its history had any army ever taken the city of Jericho in battle. And the reason for that was because it was surrounded with these gigantic great walls. First of all, there was an earthen wall, and then there was a, a, a stone wall, a, a huge thing, and then there was another earthen wall, and then there was a gigantic stone thing. Uh, 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 and they say that from the bottom point of this multiple wall 
configuration, if you were looking from there to the, to the top of the second wall, it would be greater than the f distance of an 11-story building today. And so it, it is utterly impregnable. And so everybody knew that the only way, or please hear me, that the only way, the only way you can get into Jericho is to go through the gates. You've got to go through the gates because you can't do anything with that wall. So you've got to go through the gates. So when the scripture records that the gates were shut and barred, that just screamed out one thing, move on. <laughs> it's final. It's, it's impossible. Those gates were revised again and again and again. Huge things covered in metal and they stood I don't know how high and gigantic hinges and this thick and there's no way anybody's ever getting through those gates. So when they saw the gates were shut and barred, everything screamed out, let it go, for goodness sakes, move on from that project. Well, I mean, let's face it, you, you tried, that's fine, that's noble, but, but the, the gates are shut. Just accept it, the gates are shut. But my friends, God sent me here today to tell you two things. When the gates are shut and barred, it is not final. When the gates are shut and barred, my Father brings down the walls. You see, he's always got a way. Yeah. You know, it just simply means that, that there is no human possibility, that any human endeavor would be futile. But my friends, when every human option is gone and there are no human options left, that's when my father loves to get in on the act with his supernatural. And friends, what a lot of people do not understand is that God, when God withdraws every human possibility, that is not his neglect, that is not his severity, that is his longing for you to come in into a place and a position where you need the supernatural because he's aching to be God and he wants to sweep in with the miraculous provisions he's already provided for you. But while there's a human a, a solution, you will always take the human solution. But my friends, there are times in our lives when there's no human solution. But my God gets in on the act. And then there's miraculous... Last year, I was in hospital four times. Doctors write me off the planet like parrots. You say, what's good about that? Oh, it's a blooming awesome. <laughs> because when again and again, my father would step into the room. <laughs> and, and, and he loves doctors and said, oh, hi. But, but they're not the final say. He is. I mean, take a good look. Do I look dead to you? <laughs> Friends, man's impossibility is my father's opportunity. And listen, he's always got a reason too. Well, this is coming out a little different. <laughs> you see, he's always got a reason as well. Just think it through. Those gates being shut, oh no. We now have no possibility to get into that city. We can't do that. Gates are shut. Friends, it was part of the Father's strategy. Let me tell you about that. You see, if the gates had been left open, if they'd managed to get there in time, if it had worked out right in the first place, guess what? They'd have gone through the gates. And if they'd gone through the gates, two things. One, they would have not had needed a miracle. And two, listen to me. If they had gone through those gates, it would have been a massacre. Because it doesn't matter how many hundreds of thousands of people you've got in your army, if only 30 of them can get through the gates at a time. And the archers in the city of Jericho were just sat up there and had a 
pigeon shoot. They, 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 they would just pick them off one row at a time. Your turn. Okay, cool. And, and there'd just been a pile of Israeli bodies in the middle of the gate. The shutting of those gates wasn't father's neglect. The shutting of those gates was our father's foreknowledge of what it would happen if they did go through the gates. And he wanted to create the atmosphere of a miracle, but he also wanted a victory and a triumph that would be the minimal cost to human life. Lord, it wasn't his neglect, it was his strategy. You alive and well? You getting a hold of this? I want to say to you, friends, listen to me. (laughs) See this book here? You did what? That that is chock-a-block. This is the last 40 years of my life or something like that. And and it is chock-a-block of times when there was no human solution. And my father just turns up. And I love it. I love it. I love it getting into a situation where I know there's no human possibility because then I don't get into despondency. I don't get into discovery. Can I tell you something? Next time you get into a situation and there is no way it can be done, let your default position not be discouragement. Let it be alertness. Let it be vigilance. Let it be yay, glory. What has my father got in store this time? He's supernatural. Let him be supernatural. My friends, listen to me. I want to go right into your spirit. When the gates are shut and barred, that longing, that, that, that cry, that promise you've had in your heart and now it doesn't look like you could ever come to pass. Or that promise that God gave your marriage And now it's, oh God, what can happen? Or your ministry, or your calling, or your vocation. And now, my God, what can happen now? Oh, look up, look up, look up. Anticipation. My God is about to break through. And friends, when the gates are shut and barred, it is not final. It has never been final. Think about Moses. The chariots of Egypt are thundering down on them. They haven't got a hope. And their backs are to the Red Sea. And my friends, that Red Sea screamed out one thing. It's final because you can't go back. You can't go forward. You are going to be cannon fodder any time about now. And it is final final and all Moses does would get one word from God and raise a stick up in the air and it was not final. Joshua's fighting out in in the valley with the Amalekites and and the sun's going down and he knows he cannot accomplish the will and purpose of God in this battle unless he has another six or seven hours but there's only an hour left or daylight or whatever it was and so what does he do except the impossibility? No, he turns around and he speaks to the sun and he says, stop! And the whole cosmos went into, into, into chaos uh, because the sun stood still because one man says, no, no, I know what my father told me to do and I don't care what the opposition is. My God's will is far greater than the opposition. So whatever stands in my way, I can take command and authority over. 20 years ago when the doctors first diagnosed my artery thing and they told me that I had to take what's left of my miserably short little life and and sit in a corner and don't breathe deep, don't talk to people, don't don't lift anything, don't get excited. (laughs) Don't get excited. Good grief. And, and, And all of this stuff. I went home and my father said to me, don't ever forget this. When my intention is perfectly blended with your unqualified obedience. There is forged in that moment a spiritual authority that is greater than any other spiritual authority that exists. And friends, I have not had a moment of anxiety from that day to this because I know something. Anything that is not according to the will of my Father, I have the authority to change. And friends, we've got to get that back in our spirit. Can you say amen? Amen. I mean, 
Hundreds of thousands, and I do mean hundreds of thousands of troops, were arrayed against Gideon's 300. And man, that screamed out it was final. But Gideon just gets a word from the Lord, and he stands up and he says, the sword of the Lord and Gideon. And next thing you know, hundreds of thousands of well-trained troops are running in panic from 300 people. Now, that defies imagination. But you see, that's when my father gets involved. Lazarus was dead in the tomb for four days. Think that through. He was dead for four days. Now, that said it was final. <laughs> but Jesus just speaks a word. <laughs> and next thing you know, Lazarus says, you know, I want to regain the party. Yay! And strides out of there. Why? Because it's not final. It's not final. It's not final. I, I was ministering up amongst the Aborigines a few months ago uh, up north, and um, we had uh, sponsored a getting together of all the uh, pastors and apostolic leaders amongst the indigenous people together in one place. Uh, and uh, apparently it hadn't been done before, and it was amazing. Uh, we had an incredible breakthrough time. And, but some of the testimonies that I got, and I verified them afterwards, they were real. And one of them, one of them got bitten. No, one of the, oh yeah, one of them did get bitten, but I don't have time for that. Okay, I'll give you the second one. The second one was he came out of his meeting and he was set upon and he was beaten, stabbed, I don't know how many times, ripped open, left on the footpath and he bled out and he died. And they took him in. And, and everybody was weeping and wailing and they took him in and they put him in the morgue and then they zipped him up in the bag and then they stuck him in the freezer and three days later, father says to him, kick, kick. So he kicked and he kicked the door open <laughs> and the door swings open, he unzips the bag, he sits up and the poor nurse is freaking out and, 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 and he says, excuse me, I'm stark naked, can you get me some clothes? And, 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 they, and he got out there and now he's passing this great church and, and friends, I asked several independent people, they said, no, that's exactly how it happened. Now isn't it amazing that 17 and a half people can demonstrate and it makes front page of the news but someone gets resurrected after three days in a cooler and it doesn't even make the news. So when is it final? Not until my father says so. Because he has always got a way. And my word to you for this year is push through. Push through the barrier of intimidation. Push through any pastor's appointment. Push through any barriers of conservative uh, thinking or hanging on to the past. It's a new hour. It's a new day. And my father's aching to be miraculous. Can you say amen? amen? So take this message for your personal life, for your marriage, for your kids, for your business, for your vocation, for your ministry, and certainly for our church together. When my father speaks, there's only one response. I will carry. And I will complete what you've given me to do, Father. And whatever opposition is in the way, I know that I have the authority of heaven to change it. Could we just bow every head just for a moment? Just, oh, friends, how I want you to just anticipate a miracle. Anticipate a miracle. Get up tomorrow morning. Father, I anticipate a miracle. A miracle. Get up the next morning. Father, I anticipate a miracle. Get up next Sunday morning. I anticipate a miracle. Maybe there are people here this morning that do not know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of your life. And when I talk so intimately about my father, you say, well, wow, well, let me tell you something. He loves you so much. My father 
unconditionally accepts you, indescribably loves you. He's aching to wrap his arms around you, to walk through life with you. And he said that if you can accept the atonement of his son, Jesus, on that cross and say, I want to serve Jesus as King and Lord of my life. Jesus will then swiftly take you by the hand. He'll introduce you to your Father and you will know what it is to be indescribably loved like I do at this moment. 